So now we um, move to the uh, Weiner Ziv problem. Again, it's a name chosen <coughs> based on the two persons who um, solved the problem. I don't think they necessarily came up with the problem itself. I, I, I heard stories that uh, Kerner and Alsfeder were working on it too at the same time, but I think it's clear that Weiner Ziv solved the problem first. Um, so let's look at the same. It's, it's basically, um, again, um, or very similar to the problem we just studied. So let's repeat what that was. Here we have encoder 1, and we have W1, uh, and then we have a decoder, right? So I don't know if you want to draw this or not, because I'm going to about to erase something actually after all now. Uh, W2. So now, suppose now instead of this problem where we're trying to recover x hat n and y hat n, suppose, suppose the rate here is at least the entropy of y, so effectively we have this problem, right? And so I can get rid of this one and we get nr bits. And here though, so what we're going to make new um, is of course add a distortion constraint. I mentioned that if you're trying to recover both, the general problem with both distortions is unsolved. So suppose we look at this, but now here we have a requirement. So we have a distortion requirement. Namely that D, which is equal to the expected value of 1 over n, ah, the distortion is 1 over n summation from i equals 1 to n of some distortion function of xi and xi hat has to be less than or equal to D, right? So that's, we require this, so this is required. Okay, so, and the problem is try to find, well, I've already, anyway, try to find the smallest, the smallest R, so the best compression. Um, so that for sufficiently large N, so we're not including delay as a problem. So that for sufficient large n, there is an encoder and decoder satisfying this. So that there is, there is n encoder decoder. Uh, satisfying the distortion constraint. Okay, now um, just as a quick comment in terms of, uh, you know, everyone has their favorite pet peeves, so I'll give you mine. You can ignore it. Um, a, a lot of problems in network information theory are stated that we're looking, you know, people define an n2 to the nr, n code, and then they say, well, we're looking for a sequence of codes such that something happens. But that's a very mathematical way of putting things. An engineer is happy with one encoder and one decoder. I don't care about a sequence of them. I just want one. <laughs> so I like to state the problem as one and not as a sequence. Because after all, once you have a sequence, you have to worry about does it converge, you know, what then, so on and so forth. So all this strange stuff. And all that language, of course, comes from, it's, it's also okay, but I think it comes from the Cheezer Kerner co code uh, book. Not, not code book, but book. <laughs> where they introduce this, this is a very mathematical way of thinking, which is fine, but I'd like the engineering approach. I'm happy to build one good encoder. I don't have to build like an infinite sequence of them. <laughs> it's kind of hard to do. Okay, so that's, uh, so we're looking for uh, satisfying this. So we're actually looking for rate distortion pairs. So we are looking for our, uh, we are trying to find Uh, the set, and here I'm getting to use language I didn't define of feasible, but I think you get the idea, um, RD pairs. And 
<clears throat> as usual, like also for the um, 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 rate distortion problem, we're probably expecting this to be a convex function, something like that, and that everything above can be achieved <coughs> and everything below is impossible. So we're looking for a curve like this for the problem. Uh, right. So, uh, what are some applications of this? Well, um, of course, if we didn't have this, then it just becomes the classic rate distortion problem, right? And so sometimes, though, you have, when you're um, compressing something, like suppose you're doing video compression, suppose this is a sequence of frames of a video, sometimes you have some side information available, uh, either, for example, if, it's, if you're somehow compressing in some predictive way, you know, maybe you know what the previous picture looked like. So rather than viewing it as a, automatically a, a difference distortion measure, maybe this has something to do with the past or something like that, right? But it's also useful in relay channels. We'll see this method appearing too, where like this, this box here is kind of like a relay uh, function where, and the receiver operates like a receiver that is getting a message both from a transmitter and from a relay. So we'll see these ideas appearing there too. So the concepts appear in uh, various other problems. But fundamentally, um, I think we can view it as one special case of an, of an unsolved problem, which is interesting, namely distributed source coding at two places and then um, finding the best distortion performance. This is a special case of that problem. So we have to solve this problem before we solve the general one. And we'll see there's one new idea that appears in this problem, which is very fundamentally important that we haven't covered yet. <clears throat> and that's something called an auxiliary random variable. So that'll appear uh, the first time um, for us here. It's not the first time it appeared in information theory, the idea of this concept of an auxiliary random variable. I think, uh, well, maybe when we get there, we can talk about it. Okay, so that's the problem. Any questions about the problem setup? So it's, I think, relatively uh, problem again. Uh, we'll need some one result on something that I think Toby Berger called this the Markov lemma. So is, the name has at least stuck. Um, so the Markov lemma has to do with a problem that looks like this. Uh, let me write the statistical experiment. So suppose I have a joint source. Now, not the same one, just an abstract one. And suppose I put out a sequence. I'm writing it small to say I view it as being typical. It was as if it was put out by a source. And suppose I put out another sequence, y, and here I'll also write it small. I'm viewing it, when I write it big, I mean I'm viewing it as a random variable. When I write it small, I mean I'm viewing it as a sequence that's typical with respect to uh, the box. So here I'm assuming these two are jointly typical. And suppose from this one here, I now with a channel PZ given Y produce YN, uh, ZN, sorry. So anyway, what this picture represents is suppose in words, suppose um, X and YN are typical. Uh, and um, ZN is output of uh, PZ given Y with input YN, right? So that's what the picture represents. Then the claim is as follows, namely that the probability of that ZN, oh, I have to introduce one more notation I didn't define yet. That's the conditionally typical set. So I'm sorry about that. I should have done that before. So <coughs> I, don't know if, I don't know if you had this already. I have to introduce the notion of a um, conditionally typical set. So what I mean by this set, let's say uh, y, uh, x, uh, y, m, uh, sorry, p, x, y, but now I'm going to condition on x, n, is the set of y, n typical sequences such that x, n, and y, n are jointly typical. I'm not sure, did you cover that? kind of concept already, conditional typical. So, I mean, if I didn't have this here, I'm looking for all jointly typical pairs. Now I'm looking, I'm saying xn 
is some sequence, and I'm asking about this set. Um, so if you haven't seen this before, this set has some important properties. For example, its size of the set. Well, maybe I write it down here so that I don't mix up these things here. The size of this set um, is approximately 2 to the n h of y given x. Okay, h of y given x. So it's like conditioning, right? Um, is that the only property I want here? Well, there, there's a bunch of other properties. In particular, that um, if I have a situation, you know, like this, where, well, if yn was random, then the probability that yn is jointly typical with xn, if it's produced jointly, is approximately 1, of course. And if they're produced independently, then you get again going to get the mutual information, all that. But for the moment here, let's just write it like that. But I should be careful uh, if this is true, if this is typical. And if I'm really careful, I have to be a little more careful. This is true. If this is typical with some epsilon, let's say, primed, where epsilon primed is less than epsilon, right? So if you're being perfectly strict, I have to make the x sequence just a little more typical <laughs> to leave some room to make this typical. I mean, all this stuff only works at large n anyway. I mean, the closer epsilon prime and epsilon are, the bigger I have to make n to make this valid. But OK, well. It's all in the epsilons there, so. <laughs> okay, and it turns out it's zero otherwise, because it turns out for the definition we used that um, joint typicality implies marginal typicality. So if this is not typical, then we can't make the other one typical. So that was the problem. With it. Um, right, and since I've made prime tighter, um, well, it has to be typical. It has to be. A, well, I've made it tighter, so I should be careful. Uh, I should be careful how I write this. Right. Um, it's certainly true if x n. Well, this has to be true in any case. Uh, zero, zero is. I, I should be a little bit careful here. There's an issue of equality. So, I don't know. I mean, and I'm being perfectly precise here. If these are equal, then I'm not sure if it's zero. <laughs> But if it's, uh, I have to think about that. If it's equal to, no, then it's still zero. Then it's still zero. Uh, be, no, if, it, if it's equal to, then I'm not sure. It may not be zero. There may be some probability. Like it's sort of one of these boundary cases where one or the other. Anyway, let me do it this way. If uh, uh, equal, oh, sorry and is approximately, this whole thing is approximately, uh, is it going to be equal to zero, let's say, if xn is not epsilon typical with respect to px. Here I'll just use the same epsilon, then definitely it's true. <laughs> then definitely it's true. Okay. Um, but the point is, we want to we want to focus on typical x. So this is the kind of situation we have here too, almost, except that we have this intermediate y n. So what this thing here says is z n. The probability that this is in the jointly typical set, corresponding to this diagram, namely um, p y p x given y p z given y. Uh, conditioned on, let me write it out and then we'll discuss it. It's actually not a, it's not a deep, I don't think, well I'll explain why it's saying I don't think it's such a deep result, but I'll explain why in a moment. But we need it, that's important. Okay, so what do I mean by this? It looks complicated. So what I'm thinking of is this, suppose we have this experiment. We've generated two sequences. We check they're typical. We generate Zn randomly from Yn. And the question is, under this experiment, what's the probability that this Zn will lie inside this typical set? 
you know, conditioned on that yn was that yn. Well, if you look at it for a moment, actually, you know, the zn, if we're looking at this, this is exactly the distribution that we're testing for. We're test, the test distribution corresponds exactly to our situation. Um, the only thing we don't have in here that we might want in the conditioning is that xn is in here, but don't forget that xn, yn, zn forms a Markov chain. So in fact, by putting this, we've broken the chain to zn from xn, so I may as well put it in. We'll discuss a generalization of this when we get to broadcast channels, but for now let's just talk about this here. I claim this is true. This is true just by the model, right? I mean, this is a, it's a Markov chain, right? From X to Y to Z. That's how I um, have this, right? So that's why I can put in the XN in here. Um, and once you have this, it turns out that actually, the, so I should have written this, this is just simply equal to one, and that follows by just this definition, like um, it, it's the same picture as if I was just producing yn randomly and then made it a sequence. Like because I'm just asking what's the probability that zn is, I'm just asking what's the probability that zn is jointly typical if these two are jointly typical and these two are jointly typical, I want all triple to be jointly typical. That probability is just close to one. Okay, and, and it follows, the, the main step is this one where we can just introduce the xn due to the experiment. And once we have the xn, then we just view this as a new, you know, sequence, and then we get back to the basic theory. So uh, it, it's just something intuitive, I think, once you have had seen um, a little bit about typicality and what typicality means. Okay, so we'll need that here. We'll, ne we'll need that in a moment for this problem. Because what's going to happen here is we're going to gener generate a code book <coughs> here. And then we'll have the Markov chain from y to x to some new random variable here. And that will correspond in to, this will be like the y, this will be like the x, and this will be the new auxiliary variable. So we'll see that chain here coming in just a moment. That's what we need. I don't know, is there any questions about that? Something unclear? Yeah, this one, yeah. I mean, it effectively says if these, if we have a Markov chain, if these two are jointly typical and these two are jointly typical, then the triple is jointly typical. That's the important thing. That isn't, of course, true if we're asking about joint typicality with respect to another distribution because marginal typicality doesn't necessarily imply joint typicality, but for a Markov chain, that, ha that does hold. Okay, that's the important um, insight. Okay. That's called the Markov lemma. Um, fine, with that out of the way, let me just erase. Well, no, let's just start here. And now we'll just do our random coding again. So we'll again talk about uh, what is the, well, how do we build up a code book for this problem? Well, we'll do it the same way as for the um, uh, Slipping Wolf problem. Why? Because suppose I required the distortion to be zero then this is just a special case of Slepping Wolf problem. So it makes sense that we should do some kind of, you know, subset idea here too. We have to do this in order to achieve what we want for the problem where the distortion is zero and we'd like to solve the general case. So this case corresponds to like one of the corner points that we looked at before. So if, we, if the distortion is zero, and this was our region we were looking at this morning, then we're effectively going to this point here where, where this one is just being compressed at h of y. And we're asking, you know, how do we I build the encoder here? And we've already seen the encoder should, you know, compress more than it needs to. So we'll definitely need to do that anyway, but there's going to be one new trick that we add, and which is a little bit weird. And that is we're going to choose a different random variable than this, of course, but we're also not going to choose this as our code design. So if, when you think of rate distortion theory, there you choose this as your code design directly. Here we're going to choose something else. And that's what the surprise is. We need to choose something else. So let's do that. So the first thing we do is choose our, choose the following. We're going to choose a channel. 
u given x. Okay, and, and I'll just choose it for now and we'll optimize it later. And a function f mapping u, uh, u cross y to the reconstruction alphabet of x hat. So some function <coughs> we'll choose. Okay? Okay, and from this, um, well, from this we can compute, so from this of course we can compute, right, p of x is fixed, the marginal, we, so from this we can compute p, p u x and also of course we can compute p u. And now what we'll do is we'll use this p of u to generate our code book. Okay, so the code. Um, what we'll do is we'll choose 2 to the nr plus r prime, right? So we'll make the code book bigger again, right, than these nr bits. Sequences u n, w v with two indices, where w runs from 1 to 2 to the nr, and v runs from 1 to 2 to the nr prime. Uh, by choosing every letter u i w v independently via the distribution p u. Okay? So we'll still have to optimize these two objects later. Okay, but is it clear what I'm doing? So I'm, I'm doing exactly a random code construction as before. Let me draw it, perhaps that'll be helpful. Same construction as before with these bins, right? So we'll start with un1, comma 1, un 1 comma 2 the n r primed. So that's going to be our bin 1. Bw equals 1. U n 2 1. All the way down to u n 2 to the n r. 2 to the n r prime. Right, so this here is going to be w equals 2. Those are our bins, so th that corresponds to what we will send. We also will again send only the first index, W, and we generate all letters in this entire code book statistically independently using this one distribution P. Okay, that's the design. Uh, encoding. Well, what we're doing is we're given an xn. So what we'll do now is we're given an xn, and you'll remember what you did with rate distortion theory. So for example, if this wasn't here, what's the natural choice for you? Well, just x hat, right? Because that's how we made the rate distortion code book there. Um, so in that case, what do, and what did, how did the encoding work there? Given xn, you just tried to find the sequence x hat that was jointly typical inside the code book. So we're doing the same, going to do the same thing there. So given xn, uh, try to find a pair wv such that uh, un wv and yn is jointly typical with respect to p u x, not, not yn xn, xn, right? Right. And not only that, we even know when we're successful, right? Because well, we're going to we're gonna have to make the code book big enough to be successful, right? And how big do we have to make it? Well, if, if u is x hat, you would know the answer. It would just be mutual information between x and x hat. So how big is it here? It's just mutual information between u and x. In fact, it's one-to-one -one the same theory as for rate distortion theory. This is just a, compress a, 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 no a compression step. It's exactly the same step. We just replace u with x hat. Otherwise, you can repeat the entire theory. 
So from this, so the encoding will get an one constraint, namely r plus r primed has to be bigger than i u x. That's the constraint we'll have, right? It's just one to one the same theory. Okay, now what about the decoder? Oh, before we do anything, let's talk about Markov lemma. What I will like, what I'd like to have also happen now is that the triple that I generate, namely y x n, it will be typical with high probability, and it will jointly typical with y n with high probability. Now, if I'm successful here, if these two are jointly typical, the x and the u. But notice that I have a Markov chain, y, x to u. So if these two are typical and these two are typical, then the triple is jointly typical. So that's good. I need that. Because I'll need for, I'll need in a moment, the decoder gets to see, wants to check typicality between u and y. Right? So we need the whole thing to be jointly typical. That's important that we go across. So this checks here. Um, so u, because, uh, so y, x, u is Markov. So this chain is Markov, is a Markov chain, right? So that guarantees for me that if the high probability event that these two are jointly typical and given this, I, ha I with high probability find jointly typical x and u. And since these two are jointly typical and these two are jointly typical, the triple is automatically jointly typical because of the Markov chain. At, at least it's jointly typical with respect to any distribution that satisfies this Markov chain, right? That's the important thing. Okay, is that clear why I did that? So that, that's why we need the Markov lemma, to make sure that these two will be typical. So that this brings us to the decoder. Okay, given two things, W, oh, and I forgot to say send, send W. So we drop the V, we're just going to send the W, not the V. So given W and YN, right, that's the two things this guy gets. W and YN, try to find a V tilde, a V tilde, such that uh, U and uh, W comma, let me make that colored so we see what he's looking for. Uh, UY. Typical, right? So for example, suppose we're in bin 2. We get the message 2. We know that the UN must be in here. And now we're looking for the UN, right? That, it, that was typical. And we know the correct one was jointly typical because of the Markov lemma. Okay, what can go wrong? Well, maybe we find another UN that is also jointly typical, and then we're in trouble, because then we make, may make a mistake. But if you look at that, that's just a channel coding problem, right? If we make this too big, we'll, with high probability, get a, right? The W picks out the subset, and once we know W, the subset, the rest is a channel coding problem. It's like decoding that index inside. Okay, and what's the probability? So if we look at the error event, the error event has the following form. It's going to be a union, right? So the error event that we're interested in here is the union over all V tilde not equal to the actual V that the U N uh, w and V tilde and Y N are, not, are jointly typical with respect to PUV, uh, UI. And notice though that any neighbor was generated independently of the Y and the other code book. So it's like having that these two were jointly statistically independent and yet are jointly typical with respect to PUI, which is of course going across the Markov chain, but it's still correlated, right? 
And we know that the probability of each of these events individually is at most 2 to the minus n, the mutual information between i, u. And so the union bound then just gives us a result that requires r primed. And the size of the subcode book must be less than i, u, y to make this error probability small. And actually, I should intersect with the event that, um, well, that the triple is jointly typical. I'll just make it simple on myself. Right. Anyway, that, that's, these are, I'm, you know, I'm skipping a lot of steps. I should write out every individual error probability, what's the error prob what's the probability of the event that these two are not typical? Well, that's small. Then I'm doing in the encoding step, what's the probability these two, I won't find a u that's typical? Well, that's small as long as that's satisfied. Then the next error event is that these, that the u, x, and y are not typical. Well, that probability is small by the Markov lemma. Now I need to uh, include, well, okay, what's, so these two are typical. And then what's the probability of this event happens when those two are typical, right? So I should write out a union of all error events and then use a union bound to uh, do this. But I don't want to bother with that because what's, what's a lot more fun, of course, than all these details is the constraints we get on the rates and the architecture of the encoding, right? If you look at this architecture, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment, the first step, this box is basically doing a rate distortion code. So it's like doing vector quantization with the big code book. So you're building a vector quantizer. But this, and then after doing the vector quantizing, you are hashing the bits down to a shorter length. So you're doing separate, uh, it's, it's again a separation based encoder. Here we do a vector quantizer, here's hashing, right? And then at the receiver, we actually have to build a channel decoder. So the code that I build here has to be a good vector quantizer in the whole and has to be a good channel code in every one of its subcodes. Okay, it's an interesting to think about how you would design something like that. Fortunately, there are codes that have such properties. Polar codes is one of them because <laughs> they're very easy to nest. Um, another, you know, there's lattice codes. You can build LDPC codes with um, nesting too. It's just a little trickier. Convolutional codes are naturally nestable. So if you're looking for short, good short block length codes, you can't beat convolutional codes. I mean, if you're talking up to like length 50 or so on, there's nothing better. And so the, here they're nested. So building codes for these problems is really interesting. We, we get insight into you know, the architecture of the encoder, it's a two-step encoder, and then we, the code also has to be good, though, for decoding. And that's, that's a little bit trickier and more challenging than just designing a code that's good for one thing. Here it has to be good for multiple things. And we know they exist because the random coding tells us they exist. Okay. There was a lot of recent PhDs also, uh, you know, at EPFL because they're polar coding fans, right, uh, Rüdiger, Bank, and Marco Mondelli had some nice results showing that polar codes get um, good performance for these kinds of problems. And, and other problems we'll talk about broadcast channels in particular. So this was a little bit fast. I didn't go through proof in every step. But I hope you understand, you know, the architecture, the structure that we're getting. OK, All right? Well, now we have to put these two together, do Fourier mod skin elimination here, it's easy, right? R primed is bigger, you know, R is greater than this minus R primed, but R prime is less than that. So here it's particularly straightforward. So we get that the following rate is achievable. Oh, and I should choose, I should measure the distortion yet too. So maybe I can quickly do that just formally. Um, let's check the distortion. What kind of distortion do I get here? Um, well, uh, uh, 
sure I write it properly. Okay. Because I haven't talked yet about the function, right? We had two things we had to design. One was PU given X, and the other one was this function. Okay, and um, so I should, I should complete this at the decoder. Okay, we find a typical sequence, but we still have to produce the X hat. So decoder continued. My apologies. Uh, put out x hat i f of, so what, what we do is once we've gotten the u, right, so here we've figured out what the u is, we figured out what the u is, what we do is we just take the i letter of u, the i letter of y, put it through that function to get the x i, the i letter of the reconstruction. So this is the i letter of w uh, v tilde, uh, y i. Okay, it's kind of interesting, all i. So, you know, we could have chosen this function to be a vector function, but we're just choosing it as a function that operates per symbol. That's it. Right? Let's put out, create that x. And now I should check the distortion. Let's check the distortion. Well, let, to check the distortion, let's just suppose for the moment that um, we're looking at the typical case. Uh, where here we'll have Px, Pu given x, Py given x. All right, so we have the markup chain. Um, the distortion for if this was typical, is just this. So now I have to measure the distortion. This is going to be between the i symbol and the i symbol of x hat, right? But that's the same as so here comes the function u i and y i. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is, here we have a big sum of distortions. I can reorganize this sum. There's, gonna, there's three variables here, right? Uh, a variable, uh, one value for xi, one value for ui, one value for yi. And I'll just collect all those terms in here together that have the same letters, you know, a, b, c here. How many of those are there? Well, the number of times the triple a, b, c occurs in the sequence in this triple, right? So I can rewrite this quite easily just by reorganization as 1 over n, the sum over all letters a, b, c, the number of times the letter a, b, c occurs in the sequence x, n, u, n, y, n, times d of a, f of b, c, right? Did you all see that? I mean, it was just a reorganization of the sum. Rather than summing over all letters, I just collect all those triples together that are the same. And I'm just adding them all up, right? But now if I look at this, this is n over n. What is that? That's the empirical distribution of the triple. And since I know they're typical, I know that's close to the actual distribution by the definition of typicality. So. I just continue that. Um, that means if I continue this, well, I know now that the empirical distribution is close to the actual distribution. In fact, I know it's within one plus epsilon of it. By, you know, remember typicality means the empirical value is within epsilon p of p. So this is just going to be less than or equal to the p x y uh, x u y. A, B, C times 1 plus epsilon times D of A, F of B, C. And if we take the 1 plus epsilon outside, that's just the expectation. Right? Uh, uh, well, X, well, I can write it like this. X, F 
right? It's just the expectation. Okay. And now, I mean, this is the high probability event, so the expected distortion I will get. I can write this using the law of total probability again as the probability that x uh, that the triple xn un yn is atypical. Let me just write it like that times d max. If this distortion function is bounded, like we did yesterday, plus the probability that it is typical. And then I can upper bound that by this times 1 plus epsilon expected value of d of x and x hat. Because this is just x hat. Right? And this thing here goes to 0 exponentially fast. This one here is less than or equal to 1. So I just get close within one uh, uh, a, a multiplicative factor of the distortion plus some small number. Right? And so what I get is that I get a distortion close to this, right? Right, that's my distortion I get. So if I put this all together, I get the following result. The two rate bounds are So what we require is the following first for this all to work, you'll remember we needed r plus r prime bigger than the vector quantizer step, u x, r prime, the decoding step here, less than i u y, and we require that the expected value of d of x comma x hat is less than uh, uh, less than d less than so that we can get rid of this one plus epsilon factor. Okay, and so now just, you know, r has to be bigger than r. this minus r prime, that's less than this. So what I get is the following uh, rate that we're going to call the weiner ziv rate. What I can do is minimize over everything that I'm allowed to minimize, namely this channel. And the function f, subject to the constraint that the expected value of d of x comma f of u y is less than or equal to d of the mutual information difference i of u x minus i of u y. And subject also of course that I have a Markov chain y x u is Markov. So there's a lot of complicated things to to add, but anyway, that rate is achievable <laughs> after all that complexity and uh, steps. Okay, point being, it's quite sophisticated, right? But if I was to build this, if I was to build this, that's what I have to do: build a good vector quantizer, build a hashing function, build a good decoder that takes everything into account, put out the U, and then from the U generate the X hat using this function of u and y. This isn't obvious, I think. <laughs> Look at all the steps you need. It takes some creativity, I think, to come up with all these ideas. Okay, and then to build it, okay, that's challenging too. But we do have ways of building this. You know, we know ways of doing this, at least with some coding techniques. For small alphabets, for large alphabets, it gets a little trickier. So if you're going, suppose x was Gaussian, you'd have to build a I don't know if there's a good way of building a good vector quantizer and decoder, you know, at the same time. Because polar codes won't work very well. The alphabets getting that big will screw things up. And this is a problem you will often see um, in, in, you know, vector quantizing. If you think of machine learning, machine learning has a lot to do with vector quantization over very large alphabets which is diff was difficult to treat before and somehow though these weird algorithms seem to work quite well you know but it's still not very well understood i think but it has a lot to do with quantization if you think of what classification is you're mapping a long string into a certain group of classes right or if you're doing uh, 
text prediction with words. You know, the alphabet is real, very large, and you're building some device that predicts what the next word will be. If you're right, then um, you can compress with you can compress the text much more, and so on. So, but large alphabets are interesting here. But if the alphabets are small, like suppose this was binary and this was binary, well, then we have codes that work very well. Polar codes will achieve the capacity of this with n log n complexity could actually build it. So small alphabets, the problem is solved for certain nice symmetric distributions. Large alphabets, a lot of, a lot of uh, really interesting stuff going on right now for large alphabets. A lot of interesting stuff and very important. You know, there's lots and lots of applications. And I think problems like this will also appear in, like say, machine learning contexts. You'll do classification with side information. You'll do uh, prediction of text with some extra information on the side and you know so all these variations you'll need different neural networks for each one of them and so on so I mean but it's, I think it's useful to put the two areas together because I think the network information theory gives you a lot of you know ba it gives you at least some basic structure and then when you actually build these devices you have these other basic structures that heuristically work well but there should be some way of putting these things all together very important direction, I think, for, for future work. Okay, so let's say a few more things about this expression. I have a little extra, I have a half an hour extra for the next slide, so that way I think I'm hoping I can complete both things I want to complete, because I want to do some examples now, of course. So, so let's look, look a little bit at the structure of this. <coughs> um, oh, uh, one more thing, uh, so a few things. All right, so let's make some comments on this. Um, now, some people would not accept the solution as a valid solution because we don't have any constraint on the cardinality of the this u. Now, to me, this is not, you know, it's it's not it's a good point, but it's not so central because to me, the architecture is more interesting and we're getting the architecture already of this, but some people won't accept this as any kind of solution because, well, for achievability it's okay, but if I had a converse I would need a U, some cardinality bound. So let's, uh, it turns out that if we use Car, you know, Car Theodori's theorem, Car Theodori, Dori, plus <laughs> some strengthenings, we'll get that. It turns out you can limit the alphabet size to be less than X plus one. So, um, you know, if x is small, if the alphabet size is small, like 2, then it turns out that we need to have um, alphabet sizes for the u at most 3, which is nice to know. Like, it's not too complicated. Of course, if x has a large alphabet, guess what happens? I mean, u blows up too, so that's not very helpful in terms of optimization, I think. But okay, it's, it's useful to know. I'll come back to that at some point. Uh, that's first comment. We can restrict... Um, you know, attention to uh, auxiliary random variables u with a limited alphabet size. Uh, the second thing is suppose we look at this and write this out. Um, one thing that's interesting to think about is the following. Suppose, suppose this y was also available to the encoder. Well, how would we now do things? Um, so that there you should be able to compress more, right? If we're giving extra information to the encoder, you should be able to compress more. It turns out this problem is actually much easier to solve because what we can do is if y appears at the encoder, for every appearance, let's suppose this was binary, for every zero we get in the sequence, we can just collect all the zeros together and then we have a classic problem with just zeros. And if we collect all the ones together, we have a classic problem with ones and it turns out the best um, way to build codes is to do well, you'll get an average rate distortion function now. But let me write that out a little bit more carefully. So suppose we, suppose we do this. This I can write as h of u minus h of u given x minus h of u minus h of u given y. So this is the same thing as h of u given y minus h of u given x. And now I use the fact that yxu is a Markov chain, so I can always put in a y here, right? 
because there's Markov chain. So this is nothing but the mutual information between u and x given y, right? But if we look at x hat, x hat is a function of u and y, right? x hat is a function of u and y. So I can put in here x hat, which is a function of these two. And this thing here is going to be bigger than i x hat x given y, right? Okay, and what that shows you, this turns out to be the rate distortion function. So this is the uh, rate distortion function if yn is also available to the transmitter, uh, to the encoder. And in general, this function here is strict, that inequality is strict. There are some cases where, the, where they're the same, and we'll look at one interesting such case. Okay, but usually you'll have a strict inequality here for most problems, which makes sense because, you, okay, I mean, it, it definitely always has to be bigger. We can always compress more if, if we had y available here. But that's just a sanity check to make sure that is really true, so that's what we see here. Okay. Questions about those two details? They're just comments. It's not so central. I mean, fundamentally, we want to look at you know this thing. Here. Okay. So let's do an example. Still have five minutes for this, and then we'll do the converse in the next hour. Let's do an example. Okay. Perhaps the most interesting example to look at here is the Gaussian example. So let's just suppose that x, y, the source is a normal distribution with zero mean and with covariance matrix that looks like this. Sigma x squared, sigma x, sigma y, rho, sigma x, sigma y, rho, sigma y squared. So in other words, you know, these are two correlated Gaussian random variables. So could, we can think of y as being x plus noise, right? That's x plus noise. Uh, now here it makes sense to talk about Gaussian variables because we're permitting distortion, right? So of course if we were had distortion zero, we know that this rate will become infinity. It better become infinity because that's an infinite precision problem. But with distortion it starts becoming interesting. Okay. So let's do some calculations. Well, the first thing we have to do is choose a channel, pu given x. So we have to choose a pu given x, and we have to choose a function. So let's choose some natural things. What's a natural choice for you? Well, it's probably a Gaussian random variable. So a noisy version of something. The only thing it can be a noisy version of is x. <laughs> so this should just be x plus z where z is itself Gaussian, uh, zero mean, and let's just say variance sigma z squared, and independent of x, and of course independent of y as well, because there's the Markov chain, u, u, x, y. Right? So we make that choice. What kind of function should we choose? What would be your est? What would be your function? Probably should be a linear function because, after all, uh, we want to make everything Gaussian as the natural thing. What's the natural linear function to choose? Well, there's only one when you're talking about, and that's the minimum mean squared error estimator, right? So we'll choose this function to be the expectation of x given u and y. That's the MMSE estimate. It's conditional expectation. What do we know about the conditional expectation? It has a very nice property. The MMSE estimator, there's a conditional independence. There's the orthogonality principle. What does the orthogonality principle say? It says that the error in the estimate is orthogonal to the two variables I have. So I already have a very nice property here. 
by choosing this, namely that x minus x hat is orthogonal to uy. And since they're all Gaussian, that means they're uncorrelated, which means independent. So it is independent. of Uy by the orthogonality principle. And the fact that all variables are Gaussian, because the orthogonality principle gives me uncorrelated and Gaussian gives me independent. Okay, very nice properties. With this, the, it'll get really easy. Everything will get really straightforward. We always love independence. That's a good thing. So you'll remember, what, what do we have to compute? You'll remember this expression is, I just computed it before, is the same as the mutual information between x, u, and y, right? This was equal, we just showed before it was equal to this. So let's just compute that. That is going to be the differential entropy of x given y minus the differential entropy of x given y and u, right? This here is fixed. That's the joint Gaussian sources. What about this? Well, u and y give me x hat, so this thing here is equal to h of x minus x hat, given u y. Why? Because x hat is a function of u and y. But now I, those, these two are statistically independent by the orthogonality principle. So I can just say this is h of x minus x hat. And what do I know about the error? It's um, well, the entropy of the error is going to be um, less than or equal to one half log of two pi e times the variance of the error. And I forgot to add the distortion function, but you sort of probably guessed what it was supposed to be. We require that, <laughs> I forgot that, that the expected value of x minus x hat squared is less than or equal to b. I should have added that to the problem. I forgot to add the distortion function. There, there's my semantics. Those are the semantics. Right, and and since I know that this has to be less than or equal to d, I can say, well, um, this thing here, um, the variance of this has to be less than or equal to d, and so then, um, well, I, I'll just choose it to be d. So what I'll choose is sigma z squared. Um, I, I want to choose sigma z squared so that the power in the air is d. That's what I do. Did I do that here? Um, I guess I still have to worry about that a little bit. Um, well, I'll choose, I'll choose sigma z squared. It's so large. I mean, I, if I choose it to be zero, then of course the error is zero. If I choose to be huge, it's infinity. And all, there's always something in between. So I'll just choose sigma z squared so that this is equal to, um, uh, um, this is Gaussian. So I'll choose, uh, so this is choose sigma z squared so that the expected, that the, um, the energy or the power in that is equal to d, then this is just becoming one half log of two pi e d, right? And since this is Gaussian with conditional, we can com compute that too. That's one half log of two pi e sigma x <coughs> squared one minus rho squared. So putting it all together, we get that the following rate is achievable. For the Gaussian case, um, the rate distortion function. Now I have to prove that this is optimal, but we'll just look at it and then we'll claim it's optimal. That this choice is all optimal. We'll get one half log. So the two pi e's cancel as usual. We'll just get sigma x squared one minus rho squared over d. Okay. And it turns out that this, the reason we know this rate is optimal is, um, you know, as long as d is uh, greater than sigma x squared, one minus rho squared. Um, otherwise, the value will just become zero, right? Then we don't have to send anything. <coughs> 
But anyway, the reason we can see this is optimal is it because it turns out this is exactly what you'd get with a conditional rate distortion function. So if you do a conditional rate distortion function, that's exactly the rate you would get. Now I'd have to prove that, but I don't want to do it. So, but it, that's it's not too um, it's not too hard to show that this this thing here is the same as the conditional rate distortion function. And it's a remarkable fact. Why? Because we're getting the same rate. It's, it's a little bit like the Slepian Wolf problem. Even though we don't know this y at the encoder, we're getting the same compression rate with the same distortion. And that's what's remarkable about Gaussian sources. Okay, and we'll see. Actually, I, this it was actually this insight, and I'll mention that again when we get to the uh, dirty paper coding problem. Uh, so the dirty paper coding problem, Max Costa wrote a paper in the mid 80s where he sh showed that if you have um, a Gaussian channel you don't lose anything <laughs> um, even though the transmitter knows the interference the receiver does not. And he has a footnote in his paper saying he thanks Tom Cover for suggesting this to him. I'm pretty sure Tom Cover took his intuition from the Weiner Ziv problem because it, it, it was it's the that problem is classic dual of this one. And here you see Gaussian has this remarkable property that even if you don't know the other sequence at the transmitter, you don't lose anything in terms of rate. Now you might lose something in terms of complexity. I mean, this is quite a little bit more complex algorithm than the original one, but the rate is the same. And I think if you see this, then you would probably guess if you understand the problem that if you go to a dual problem, something similar should happen, which indeed is the case, which got a lot of attention. <laughs> uh, because I think it's a little bit more, um, maybe bigger deal there, I don't know. But anyway, uh, any questions about that? I went a little bit fast now, but it was basically, the basic thing to know is um, the choice of these variables, the channel and the function, goes into directly into your design now. We would use a vector quantizer. We would use a vector quantizer that quantizes to this, right, x plus z. That's the same thing as a regular Gaussian vector quantizer. There you would have x hat is x plus z. So that's nothing new. So here would just be a classic vector quantizer. Hashing. And then the function we're using is, not surprisingly, an MMSE output where the MMSE court is just a per letter operation. So it doesn't even have to be an MMSE operation on the vector. You just do many MMSE operations on every letter. That's all you do. And that will give us the best possible performance. Yeah, it's quite remarkable. I mean, it's a very, it's a very pretty complicated problem already, I think. Um, um, main, main new thing was this auxiliary random variable. That's what entered the picture see that showing up in other problems too. Yeah, I know it's very fast, a lot of information <laughs> coming at you, but yeah. Good, so let's just take a break and then we'll start again at four. I'll do the converse, um, which isn't too hard for this problem, and then I'll start with the a, a dirty paper coding problem, which is the dual the dual problem of this one.